Well, I think the, there's a lot of factors that add up to what makes Fort Collins Fort Collins and the great community that it is. I think you have to start with the climate and the geography, uh, the location, the landscapes, the open space, the Poudre River, CSU. There's just a whole lot of factors that uh, contribute to what we are today and what we've been in the past and what will be in the future. And then everyone, of course, is going to mention the people, and, and that is true. Um, but the way I see it with the people, it's been a unique combination of common sense and uh, vision. So you can, a lot of communities have common sense, a lot of them have too much vision and not enough common sense. We've kind of had uh, people, active people, citizens, that have had a combination of the two, and they've also been willing to fund the community assets that we have today through taxation and philanthropy. So the generosity has also been a major part of that. And then I think a third element uh, might be that the electorate, the citizens, have given their elected officials a pretty long leash at times to maybe even get out a little ahead of the community. And I think that's a, that's a good thing. And then if the elected officials get out too far, they tug them back a little bit. But they've allowed them to get out there and, and push at times. And I think that's served the community well um, in the long run. It was quite a bit different. Um, some things are the same, but there was a whole, uh, it was kind of a different world back then. It was half the population that it is today. It's half the square miles that it is today. So it's about 80,000 people then, and we're approaching 150,000 now. So there was uh, a lot more open space. Um, it wasn't as crowded. It wasn't as noisy. It wasn't as hectic. It was kind of more of a, a small, to medium-sized university town feel, kind of more rural, uh, less urban feel than it is today. So structurally, it was quite a bit different. Non-structurally speaking, uh, the issues, um, a lot of the issues are the same as they were back then, whether it be well, railroad issues or uh, growth issues, development issues. So there were a lot of the same issues. There was a lot more citizen involvement um, regular citizen involvement in local government uh, on issues and also on boards and commissions. I think it was people thought that they had more of a chance to have an impact in a smaller community than a larger community and now there's more economic special interest dominance of local politics and less regular citizen involvement and I don't view that as a positive development at all but I think it is an observation that is accurate. Also the technology is so much different. It was a big deal when I got a pager. That was of course we email had just come in for city council. It was a new thing then. In fact we were one of the first communities, one of the first communities our size for sure in the country to have email and then I had a pager so that if the city wanted to get in touch with me if there were no cell phones or things like that. So the technology is just different. You know pre-Facebook, uh, pre-Twitter, all those kinds of things. So it was a different world technologically speaking as well. So it was uh, a lot of the same as it is today and a whole lot that was different back then because it's been over a quarter of a century now. Some of the issues that we tried to work on uh, back a quarter of a century ago that are still around today are the trains going through the middle of town. We actually worked very specifically on relocating uh, the trains from going through the middle of Fort Collins and that was going to cost somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 million dollars which I believe the figure today is a billion dollars so um, it seemed like a lot of money at the time and there were complications other than money so that's still an issue that's talked about from time to time the smoking ordinances we started back in the in the mid 80s and those issues were being considered again another version of those just last week on the City Council so there are many things that continue traffic congestion was an issue then it's an issue now Transport, how much public transportation can the community, is the community willing to afford and how much do we need? So to, uh, the bus system is another good reason, another good example of that. And we have Max coming online um, for good or bad. There are supporters and detractors of that. But a lot of the same issues um, come around uh, development in neighborhoods that are viewed as um, 
not a positive development. The growth issues, the growth pressures, and that's just never going to go away as a discussion point in Fort Collins. And, and then through time, we resolve some of the issues that maybe are hot button issues at the time, or they may seem to be resolved and then they pop up again later on. I think the actual end of the term, and I don't mean that facetiously, I mean it was the totality of the work because there wasn't um, any kind of catastrophe or any kind of scandal through my term as mayor. So there's not one moment that stands out. It was more that when I came into office, there had been a historic amount of change at the council level and at the management level in the city of Fort Collins, from the city manager uh, changing to many senior managers to a couple council resignations and to some it seemed like the world was ending and city government was in chaos. The truth is they were all for different reasons that people left. It was very flukish developments. Um, some were encouraged to leave, most just uh, moved elsewhere. It was time to do something else, uh, complications in family or whatever, but it seemed like it was all coming to a head at one time. And at the time I said six months from now no one will notice that we even went through all of these changes, things will be calm and we'll be better off than we were before, and all of that came to pass. So I guess it's the totality of the term as mayor that I'm the, I'm the proudest of rather than one individual thing because the council worked very well together. The council worked together with the new management and staff very well. We went overboard uh, in a good way to make sure that things were just highly functioning we didn't really avoid issues, but we didn't take on anything that would derail us from what we needed to be doing of kind of back to the basics at that time is what we needed and to kind of have a steady, uh, a steady operation. So there wasn't a whole lot of uh, uh, exciting, hot button, glamorous issues at the moment, but we did a very good job doing what we needed to do for that time in history. So that was what I felt good about at the end of the term. There wasn't really one moment or one issue. We're not under a strong mayor form of government, so it really is all about lots of people, starting with the citizens and management and staff, all of the city employees, your fellow council members. It really isn't one person doing any one thing, and it's almost that no one council does one thing because many of these issues carry over a period of years from the time when they start to the time when they're finally voted on. And then there's oftentimes, sometimes even a five-year gap or a seven-year gap between what you pass and what's actually built out of the ground, whether it's an epic, the, uh, the ice arena, or a senior center or those kinds of things. Oftentimes, you're out of office as mayor or council member by the time you actually did the things till the time they actually get built. There's often a long lag time. so. As far as specifics, it's just fun to see the things built later that you pass while you're in office. And we, of course, did a capital, uh, capital improvements project that I've done worked on so many through the years that I can't remember the specifics of all of what was in that. But that clearly came to fruition with parks and public facilities and street improvements and those kinds of things. We also did start to give a little more focus to environmental issues and recycling and open space and those kinds of things and I'm very proud that we did that. I think that's a pretty easy one for me in that I was lucky enough again not to have any scandals revolving around the city at the time, not that Fort Collins has a big history of that because we don't, or any uh, catastrophe, no, no great flood or horrible thing that happened during that period of time. So I guess my biggest challenge was just overcoming the doubters. I was quite young, I was 35 years old, uh, independent, new to a lot of people, outspoken, environmentally leaning, neighborhood leaning, citizen oriented, and I think it made a lot of people, more establishment folks, nervous that I was becoming mayor. So I think the biggest uh, challenge to overcome was proving the doubters wrong and to have a steady hand uh, with city government at the time, which was really needed for the changes that I've talked about 
Previously, the city was going through so many changes with personnel and management and council members, and it turned out to be pretty easy with the council that got along very well, and we worked together, all of us, as I've stated. But just the kind of the challenge that um, I was under the microscope and wanted to prove the doubters, uh, which weren't a large number, but they were important folks that thought it was gonna be uh, perhaps the end of the world, that new values, someone that was bringing in new values, new people into local government, a new viewpoint, a new attitude, that it might not be what, what they wanted to see. And it turned out, uh, history has proven that it turned out uh, very, very well. Again, it wasn't, I'm not, I'm not implying that it was a lot because the year was very successful. I wouldn't have become mayor if there wasn't support. But among a small group of folks, as I mentioned, that they thought the world was ending, as much drama and angst as they thought there might be, there was the other extreme, actually. There was no drama. Uh, and I'm not saying controversy is a bad thing because I think conflict and controversy can lead to very positive uh, changes in a community and in a culture. They just didn't happen to be at that time because it wasn't exactly, the timing was for something else at that time. And I think you need to try to, leadership tries to, needs to try to match the times. And at the time, what we needed was um, someone steady on the, at the helm. And that's what we did. And again, it's not an I thing because we're not a strong mayor form. It was the whole team from the city citizens, the community, uh, the city organization, and council members working together. It was just kind of trying to right the ship. We had some budget challenges at the time, so it was kind of a back to basics time and a back to a steady government time, and, and that's what we did. That's what was promised, and that's what was delivered. And so it's kind of not as um, politically sexy as some other times, but again, times call for different kinds of leadership, and. That was the leadership that was needed at the time, and so that's what we did. I wish I had one that stands out as my fondest memory, but I'm kind of glad I don't in a way, because again, it's the totality of the work to me that, that we all did together at a time when it was needed with all the changes that were going on in local government. And by the way, it wasn't just local government, as I recall. It was at the hospital level, it was at the school district level, it was at the county level. So it was the cumulative impact of all of these changes happening at once for a variety of different reasons. So people, some folks were a little uncomfortable that it seemed like everything was unraveling when it really was just for flukish reasons and it really wasn't unraveling. So what again was needed was kind of a steady hand and again it's not just one person. So the fondest memory is actually everybody pulling together and things actually being better off six months later than they were before, as promised. And that's just the thing that stands out to me, that I just have a very good feeling for my time as mayor, but it's more not about one or two or three things, it's about the whole experience. Now I do feel good that we opened up local government, that we made it more accessible, that we made it more responsive. I believe we made it more fiscally responsible. We were going through some budget uh, uh, difficulties at the time, and I think we focused a lot on some of the city basics, and maybe it was the first time in a long time that we looked at maybe uh, trimming a few things that we didn't need to do anymore, or that we could revisit in better times later so it's just more the totality of the work and then also just the people that you worked with the staff members the management the citizens the council members that you worked with people that you still run into today 25 26 years later that you run into on the street or in the grocery store and just positive things come up about the interaction that you had or the ability to help individuals or organizations or other bodies, other governmental bodies, or helping families that needed something at that time and the ability uh, to have the ability and the resources to help them. Those are the kinds of things that come together to me rather than just one item. Now at different times, mayors get that one item or those two things. 
Again, in my time, it was more just the overall experience of governing and working with people and getting a lot of things done. There wasn't one big item that was happening at that moment. I think probably the fact that we, again, as a, a team and individuals and as a team, tried to establish that the citizens and the elected officials are the ones that actually should be governing the community. The top of the flow chart is citizens and then the city council. And that government isn't about unelected managers and bureaucrats and economic special interests and the self-anointed elites running the uh, local government. It really should be the citizens through their elected officials. And I think that was a dramatic shift. It was um, gradual over a period of years, but it was a seismic shift nonetheless that uh, we weren't, we were no longer just a rubber stamp body coming in representing a narrow band of values that just kind of voted yes on what the recommendations of the city manager and the city organization were. We had our own ideas of governing, what the issues should be, what the outcome of those issues should be, based on what was best for the citizens and the community, and not just a very narrow group of values and a very small number of people. That would be probably uh, the thing that I'm overall uh, proudest of. A couple of other things that I feel good about too are that we brought a lot of new people into local government, new values, new viewpoints, people that hadn't been involved before that felt excluded. And I think that continues to this day. And another thing that continues to this day was an increased emphasis on neighborhood, uh, protecting neighborhoods and neighborhood quality, open space issues, environmental issues, community planning and those kinds of things. We really put a lot of focus on that that I think carries over to this day. I think we might be sliding a little backwards right now on some of those in watching currently what's going on in local government at the council level. But hopefully that's just a slight dip and we'll get back to where we need to be. Oh, I love talking about leadership. I think uh, courage is really important, the courage to do the right thing and change of any sort requires courage. And so to have the courage to not only do the right thing, to, but the courage to make unpopular decisions. And to recognize that as uncomfortable as conflict can be, that uh, Frederick Douglass said, without struggle there is no progress. So there is going to be conflict, it's how you handle it, but it's not a bad thing. In fact, anything worth doing pretty much throughout history in the political arena has involved conflict. So you don't have to seek it out, but you realize it's gonna come and how you handle it's important. The other thing is to kind of be a voice for those that are voiceless. The powerful uh, interests and, and the economic special interests and other powerful interests are very capable of uh, looking out for themselves. They have the resources and the political clout to do it. So I think a good leader tries to look out for those that don't necessarily have the uh, money, that don't have the political clout, and to try to make their lives better. Also, it's important to take the long view and to look out 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 50 years and also try to be cognizant of being on the right side of history, that you're not just making a decision today because that seems to be the dominant viewpoint when uh, 10 or 20 or 30 years from now it looks like you were in the dark ages in, in your thinking and that examples could be through the years civil rights and those kinds of things. To try to be on the right side of history and to be ahead of the curve and to try to make the decisions that um, might, make, might not be easy in the moment but that will be proven to be right in the short term view of history and most importantly in the long term view of history. It also is just a lot of work. You've got to make sure that you're willing to do the homework going in and study the issues and to go in and not just with opinions but to go in with facts and science and lots of background material so you're not just going in and spewing opinions but you're actually trying to make decisions based on the best information available. It's not really uh, the glorious part of the work but it's very very important to do so and also to remember that you can feel all the things you want, 
but uh, as has been written, sentiment without action is the ruination of the soul. So you really should put what you believe, uh, what you think is in the best interest of the citizens and the community and um, the environment and all of the things that we're working on, you really ought to try to put those into action. And then finally, perhaps, it's real important, it's called leadership, not followship. So you really need to try to be proactive and not reactive, and I believe you should be playing offense, not defense, and to try to be in there for the right reasons to better people's lives, to protect our community, to protect our environment, and to be in it for the right reasons. And it's all over very quickly as it is, so to try to make the most of the time while you're in there because there's no guarantee that you'll get another term or that those terms won't come to an end. So to make, uh, as we said in Iowa growing up, make hay while the sun shines. Well, I wish I could paint a more rosy picture of the future 25 years and 100 years out, but then I'd be breaking one of my main rules, is, which is to try to tell it as straight as you possibly can, to just be a straight shooter and speak your truth and um, let the chips fall where they may. And so I'm going to continue that. And I think when you look at the population projections for a billion people in the United States, and when you look at uh, the projections for Colorado to have uh, out 10 to 20 million people and millions more along the front range. It's really not a, a pretty scenario if that's the one that we let happen. There'll be uh, more of all of the negative and less of all of the positive. There'll be less open space, there'll be more crowding, there'll be more traffic congestion, there'll be less freedom, there'll be less uh, uh, places to go and, and, and to romp away from it all it'll be a more expensive place to live. So unless we make some uh, difficult and challenging decisions, I don't, I don't see it being anything remotely resembling the Fort Collins of today in the positive way, let alone the Fort Collins of 25 years ago. When you just start cramming that many people in a location, there's a caring capacity. As a wildlife biologist by training, it's caring capacity. There, you, we can only support so many people at a certain quality of life in any area, be the, be the restraints, be water, land, but especially when you get into the quality of life and what that's going to be like looking out. So the challenges facing decision makers today and decision makers of the future is to finally tackle it and to not have their head in the sand and, and think that we can continue on this rate of growth that we've had for the last 30 years and to even possibly rationalize that it's going to be the same quality of life that it is today that the people have. It, it just isn't. So that's the challenges for the future. Again, um, I just see more concrete and less nature to, to summarize, and I don't think that's going to be as good a place to live. Now on the, on the positive side for some, 100 years from now, um, I won't be mayor or on city council but I'm not gonna make any promises for 25 years from now that I won't be on council or mayor.